Welcome back to the second video on how to use R from Weka. Last time we saw how we can install the R plugin for Weka so that we can use some of the functionality in R from Weka. And we saw how we can issue a simple command in the R console in the Weka Explorer to plot some data. Today we're going to look a bit more at the extensive plotting functionalities in R. More specifically, we look at the ggplot2 package for R and what kinds of plots we can generate with this package. Okay, let's get started. To save some time, I've loaded the iris data into the Weka Explorer already. Now we go to the R console to issue our commands in the R language. The first thing we need to do is install the ggplot2 package, which is the plotting package that we want to use. Install dot packages and then in brackets and double quotes ggplot2 okay okay it's finished now that we've downloaded and installed the package we can load it into the R environment by using the library function so we use library and then in brackets ggplot2 okay now the library is loaded and we can use it to plot some data. In ggplot2 we construct a plot in layers. We can add several different layers of plots to construct very complex plots. But there's one layer that is always present in every plot. That is the data layer which specifies the data that needs to be plotted. The data layer is specified using the ggplot function. So with the ggplot function we specify the data we want to use. In this case, the data is referred to using the R data variable. R data is the name of the variable that refers to the data that we've loaded into the preprocess panel. And then we need to also say which attributes in the data we want to use. This is done using the aesthetics function, the AES function. As a second argument, we use the result returned by the aesthetics function. We say x equals petal length to specify the petal length attribute as the attribute we want to plot. In this case, we're just generating a plot based on a single attribute in the data. Okay, this is now the data layer for our plot. We also need to add a geometry layer, which actually specifies what type of plot we want to generate. Let's say we want to generate a kernel density estimate based on this attribute that we have selected. Then we add another layer to our plot using the plus operator and we call the geometry function for density estimates geom underscore density. Okay, let's try this. Right, so now we have a kernel density estimate for the petal length attribute. On the x-axis we have the value of the petal length attribute and on the y-axis we have the density estimate. And you can see that there are two peaks in this density of estimate. But you can also see that the plot is not wide enough to cover the entire area that is relevant. So we should increase the limits of the plot and we can use it by adding a call to the xlim function where we specify the lower limit and the upper limit. Let's say we use 0 as the lower limit and 8 as the upper limit. Okay, that looks better. But perhaps this kernel density estimate is still a little bit too smooth. It doesn't show enough detail in the data because the kernels that are used are too wide. So let's reduce the width of each kernel. We can do that by specifying the adjust argument for the geom underscore density function. This multiplies the width of each kernel by the given parameter. Let's say we halve the width of each kernel estimator. Now we get a plot showing a little bit more detail. In Weka, we primarily deal with classification problems. So really, we should try to take the class information into account in our plot. We can do that by generating three different plots, one for each class value, and combine them in one graph. How do we do that? It's very simple. We just add another argument to the call of the aesthetics function. We just say the color is given by the class attribute in our data. 
class is the name of the class attribute in the iris data. We just say the color is based on the class attribute. And now we get a separate kernel density estimate for each of the three classes. You can see that the distributions for iris versicolor and iris virginica overlap a little bit, but iris setosa is nicely separated. We may want to enhance this plot by filling the area under each estimate. This is also easy. It's again done by providing an additional argument to the aesthetics function. We just say the fill color should also be based on the class attribute. You can see that there is a little bit of a problem here. We can't really differentiate the iris versicolor and the iris virginica cases. We should introduce some transparency in our plot. We can do that by providing an alpha value for our kernel density estimators. This is a value between 0 and 1 that determines the amount of transparency. 1 means no transparency, 0 means totally transparent. Let's set this to 0.5. So now we have a nice plot of the three kernel density estimates. Let's say we want to plot the same kind of plot but for all four attributes in the iris data, not just the petal length attribute. We can also do that but we need to massage our data a little bit to achieve that. We need to load a library called reshape2 library reshape2 And then we can call the so-called melt function to transform our data into an appropriate format. Melt our data. So the new data in the new format will be stored in n data. Let's just have a look at what this data looks like. We can just type in n data and it will show us the data. You can see that we have 600 instances in the transformed data set. There are three attributes in the data set. The class value is given as the value of the first attribute. The name of the attribute is given as the second attribute. And the attribute value is given as the third attribute. Scrolling all the way up to the first instance, we can see the first attribute now is called class. The second attribute is called variable and the last attribute is called value. We have 600 instances because there are four attributes and 150 instances in the original data set. We now have a separate data set for each of the attributes. So first we have all the attribute values for the 150 iris flowers for sepal length. Then we have all the 150 iris flowers for sepal width. Then we have petal length. And finally, we have petal width. So now that we have the data in this format, we can use the variable attribute as a way to generate different plots for each attribute. How do we do that? It's quite simple. Our x value is now based on the value attribute in this transformed data. That is the actual numeric value for each of the attributes. The color is still based on the class and at the end we now use the facet underscore grid function to generate a grid of facets where facets are subplots. Here as arguments for the facet grid function we need to specify which attribute should be used for the x dimension of the grid and which the attribute should be used for the y dimension of the grid. In this case, we only have one uh, meaningful dimension. Let's say we want to use variable as the variable determining the x dimension. Then we use the tilde character to separate the x dimension and the y dimension. In this case, we don't have a variable for the y dimension of the grid, so we just use a full stop. This means there will be just one column in the grid. Okay. I forgot to change the name of the data. We want to plot n data, not r data.
Now you can see that we have a different plot for each attribute. In the first facet, the first row in this case, we have the sepal length, the second row we have the sepal width, the third row we have the petal length, and the fourth row we have the petal width. We can also use columns instead of rows simply by swapping the order of the arguments here. So we can use a dot on the left hand side of the tilde and variable variable on the right hand side. And now we have the kernel density estimates arranged vertically. Now that we have generated a nice looking plot we may want to save it as a PDF file. We can do that quite easily as well. We just need to redirect the output of the plot. We do that by using the PDF function and we specify a file name. Let's say users iber documents test.pdf and we simply call the plotting function again. Now it's actually printing the plot into the PDF file and to redirect our plot to the window again we just call the div.off function. There are many other types of plots that we can generate with ggplot2. We can generate scatter plots, two-dimensional kernel density estimate plots and many other plots. One very useful type of plot that we cannot generate with WECAS own graphical user interfaces is a box plot. So let's generate a box plot for the iris data for each attribute individually using facet grids. First we need to specify the data layer again using the ggplot function. ggplot, let's say we use this n data that I've already prepared and then we use the aesthetics function to specify what exactly we want to plot. We want to plot the value on the y-axis in a box plot and we want to use the class to distinguish different po box plots on the x-axis. And we want the color to be also based on the class. Okay, now we use the geom underscore box plot function generate box plots and we use the facet grid function again to generate a grid of plots. In this case let's say we use variable to determine the column. As you can see here we have a really nice set of box plots. First we have the box plot for sepal length then for sepal width then for petal length and for petal width. So we have generated a fairly complex plot here. We can generate many more types of plots using ggplot2. Hopefully this has given you a taster. See you next time.